I want to tell about some of the special problems that I had that are rather interesting. One of them had to do with the safety of the plant at Oak Ridge. Los Alamos is going to make the bomb. But at Oak Ridge, they're trying to separate the isotopes of uranium, uranium-238 and uranium-236, the latter, which is the 235, which is the explosive one, all right? So they were just beginning to get infinitesimal amounts from an experimental thing of the 235, and at the same time, they were practicing. There's a big plant that was going to be, we're going to have vats of this stuff, and they're going to chemicals and re take the purified stuff and then re-purify and get it ready for the next stage. They have to purify it in several stages. So they were practicing the chemistry on the one hand, and they were just getting a little bit from one of the pieces of apparatus experimentally on the other hand, and they were trying to learn how to assay it to determine how much uranium-235 there is in it, and we would send instructions, and they never got it right. So finally, Segre said that the only possible way to get it right is to go down there to see what they're doing to understand why the assay is wrong. The Army people said, no, it's our policy to keep all the information in Los Alamos in one place and that the people in Oak Ridge would not know anything about what it was used for. They just knew what they were trying to do. I mean, the higher people knew they were separating uranium, but they didn't know how powerful the bomb was or exactly how it worked or anything. And the people underneath didn't know at all what they were doing. And the Army wanted to keep it that way, that there was no information going back and forth, but Segre finally insisted on it, that it was important. They could never get the assays right. The whole thing would go up in smoke. So Segre went down to see what they were doing. And as he was walking through, he saw them wheeling a tank, carboy of water, green water. The green water is uranium nitrate. He says, uh, you're going to handle it like that when it's purified, too? They said, sure, why not? Well, won't it explode, he says. Huh? Explode? How are they going to... And so the Army said, you see, we shouldn't have let any information go across. <laughs> well, it turned out that the Army had realized how much stuff we needed to make a bomb, 20 kilograms or whatever it was. And they realized that that much material purified would never be in the plant, so there was no danger. But they did not know that the neutrons are enormously more effective when they're slowed down in water. And so in water, it takes mm, less than a tenth uh, no, 20, 100th, very much less material. You can make a reaction which makes radioactivity. It doesn't make a big explosion, but it makes radioactivity, kills people around, and so on. So it was very dangerous. And they had not paid any attention to safety at all. So a telegram goes from Oppenheimer to Segre, go through the entire plant, notice where all the concentrations are supposed to be with the process as they've designed it. We will calculate in the meantime how much material can come together before there's an explosion. And so two groups started working on it. Christie's group worked on water solutions, and I worked on dry powder in boxes, my group. And we calculated about how much material. And Christie was going to go down and tell them all at Oak Ridge what the situation was. The whole thing was broken down. We have to go down and tell them now. And so I happily give all my numbers to Christie and say, you have all this stuff, you go. Christie got pneumonia. I had to go. I never traveled in an airplane before. I traveled in an airplane. They strapped the secrets with a little thing with belt on my back. <laughs> the airplane in those days was like a bus. You stop off every once in a while, except the stations were further apart. You stop off and wait. There's a guy standing next to me with a chain swinging like this, saying something like, it must be terribly difficult to fly without a priority on airplanes these days. I couldn't resist. I said, well, I don't know. I said, I have a priority. A little bit later. It looks like some generals are coming. They're going to put out some of us number threes. It's all right, I'm a number two. <laughs> he probably wrote to his congressman, if he wasn't a congressman himself, saying, what are they doing sending these little kids around with number two priorities in the middle of the war? <laughs> At any rate, I arrived there, and the first thing I did was have them take me through the plant. And I said nothing, I just looked at everything. I found out that the situation was even worse than Segre reported, because he was confused the first time. He noticed certain boxes in big lots, and he didn't notice another box is in another room in a big lot, but it was the same room on the other side, and things like that. So if you have too much stuff together, it goes up, you see. So it was. A, I went through the entire plant, and I have a very bad memory, but when I work intensively, I have a good short-term memory. And so I could remember all kinds of crazy things, like building 9207, VAT number, so-and-so, and so forth, you see. So I had all that stuff. I went home that night, and I went through the whole thing, explaining where all the dangers were, what you would have to do to fix it is rather easy. You put cadmium in uh, solutions to absorb the neutrons in the water. You separate the boxes so they're not too dense, uh, too much uranium together, and so on, according to certain rules. And so I worked out all the examples and how it worked. 
I felt that you couldn't make the plant safe unless you knew how it worked and so forth. So the next day there's going to be a big meeting. Well, I forgot to say before I left, uh, Oppenheimer said to me, uh, now he said, when you go, they're following people are technically able down there at Oak Ridge, Mr. Julian Webb, and so and so and so. I want you to make sure that these people are at the meeting, that you tell them the safety problem, that they really understand they're in charge. And I said, suppose they're not at the meeting, what am I supposed to do? He said, then you should say, Los Alamos cannot accept the responsibility for the safety of the Oak Ridge plant unless these guys. I said, you mean me, little Richard's going to go in there and say, <laughs> he says, yes, little Richard, you go and do that. I said, I really grew up fast. You know? <laughs> so when I arrived, sure enough, I arrived there and the meeting was the next day and all these people from the company, the big shots in the company and the technical people that I wanted were there and the generals and so forth that were interested in the problems and organizing everything. It was a big meeting about this very serious problem of the safety because the plant would never work. It would have blown up. I swear it would have if nobody had paid attention to it. So there was a lieutenant who took care of me. He told me that some colonel says that I shouldn't tell them how the neutrons work and all the details because we want to keep the thing separate. But I just tell them what to do to keep it safe. I said, in my opinion, it's impossible for them to understand or to obey a bunch of rules that they don't understand unless they understand how it works. And so it's my opinion that it's only going to work if I tell them. And Los Alamos cannot accept the responsibility for the safety of the Oak Ridge plant unless they are fully informed as to how it works. It was great. So he goes to the colonel and he says to the colonel, so this is just five minutes, he says. So he goes to the window and he starts and thinks. And that's what they're very good at. They're good at making decisions. I thought it was very remarkable how a problem of whether or not information as to how the bomb works should be in the Oak Ridge plant or not had to be decided and could be decided in five minutes. So I have a great deal of respect for these military guys because I never can decide anything very important in any length of time at all. So he looks five minutes, he says, all right, Mr. Feynman, go ahead. So he sat down and I told him all about neutrons, how they worked, you know, da, 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 too many neutrons together, you got to keep the material apart, cadmium absorbs them, slow neutrons are more effective than fast neutrons, yak, yak. All stuff which was elementary primer stuff at Los Alamos, but they had never heard of any of it. So I turned out to be a tremendous genius to them. I was the gods coming down from the sky. You know. <laughs> all these phenomena that were not understood, never heard of before. I knew all about it. I could give them facts and numbers and everything else. So by being rather primitive back there at Los Alamos, I was a super genius at the other end. Well, the result was that they made little groups to make their own calculations to learn how to do it. They started to redesign plants. The designers of their plants were there, the construction designers. Uh, engineers, uh, chemical engineers for the new plant that was going to handle the separated material were there. And other people were there. And I went away again. They told me to come back in a few months. They were going to redesign their plant for the separation. So I came back in a month or so, and Stone and Webster Company engineers had finished the design of the plant, and now it was for me to look at the plant, okay? How do you look at a plant that ain't built yet? I don't know. So I go into this room with these fellas, take me into the room. There was always a Lieutenant Zumwalt that was always coming around with me, taking care of me. You know, I had to have an escort everywhere. So he goes with me, he takes me into this room, and there are these two engineers and a long table, great big long table, tremendous thing, covered with a blueprint that's as big as a table, not one blueprint, but a stack of blueprints like this. I took mechanical drawing when I was in school, but I wasn't too good at reading blueprints. So they start to explain it to me because they thought I was a genius. And they start out, Mr. Pryor, we'd like you to understand, the plant is so designed, you see, one of the things we had to avoid was accumulation. Problems like there's an evaporator working, which is trying to accumulate the stuff. If the valve gets stuck or something like that and they accumulate too much stuff, it'll explode. So they explain to me that this plant is designed so that no one valve, if any one valve gets stuck, nothing will happen. It needs at least two valves everywhere. Okay. So then he's explaining how it works. The, Carbon tetrachloride comes in here, the uranium nitrate from here comes in here, it goes up and down, it goes through the floor, comes up through the pipes, coming up from the second floor, brrr, up through the blueprints, down, up, down, up. Very fast talking, explaining it. Very complicated chemical plant. I'm completely dazed. Worse. I don't know what the symbols on the blueprint mean. <laughs> There's some kind of a thing that at first I think it's a window. It's a square with a little cross in the middle like this, all over the damn place. Lines with this damn square, lines with this damn square. I think it's a window. No, it can't be a window because it ain't always at the edge. <laughs> I want to ask him what it is. Now, you must have been in a situation like this. You didn't ask him right away. Right away, it would have been okay. But they've been talking a little bit too long. 
You hesitated too long. If you ask them now, they'll say, what are you wasting my time all this time for? I don't know what to do. I think to myself, I swear, I, I'm, often in my life I've been lucky. You are not going to believe this story, but I swear it's absolutely true. It's such sensational luck. It's, uh, I say, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? I got an idea. Maybe it's a valve. So in order to find out whether it's a valve or not, I take my finger and I put it down in the middle of one of the blueprints on page number three down in here, and I say, what happens if this valve gets stuck? <laughs> Figuring they're going to say, that's not a valve, so that's a window. <laughs> So one looks at the other and says, well, if that valve gets stuck, and they go up and down in the blueprints, up and down in the blueprints, <laughs> other guy up and down in the blueprints, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, they both look at each other, and they chick, 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 and they turn around to me, and they open them out like this. You're absolutely right, sir. <laughs> so, uh, they roll up the blueprints in the way they went, and we walked out. And Mr. Zumwalt, who'd been following me all the way through, he says, you're a genius. He says, I got the idea you're a genius when you went through the plant once and you could tell them about evaporator C21 and building 9207 the next morning. He says, and when you knew all about the new drive, you were a genius. But what you have just done, he said, was so fantastic. I want to know how, how do you do something like that? I told him, you try to find out whether it's a valve or not. That's <laughs>